Okay, well, uh, welcome everybody to the University of Toronto. It's a pleasure to have you here. And <clears throat> last year at this conference, a primary theme was uh, time, timing. Can you pull up the uh, slides? So timing was a theme, and, the, and really the question was, how fast is this all going to develop, uh, machine intelligence? And there were a number of people on this stage last year who took the position that this year in AI would be what 1995 was uh, for the internet. And that is 1995 was an inflection year. It's when the commercial internet really began to take off. And shortly after 1995, people stopped talking about the internet as a new technology. And instead, they started referring to the internet uh, as a new economy or the effects of the internet as a new economy, that the activity, the human activities around the internet had transcended the technology itself. And so <clears throat> the, the media, uh, experts, pundits of all types refer to the new economy. Basically, everybody referred to the new economy uh, except economists. And economists looked at this and said, this is the same old economy we've always uh, observed. There's just been some changes in the relative costs of, of certain things like search and the dig digital distribution of uh, goods and services. And that's the way economists think about all technology. That essentially, economists think about technologies as drops in the costs of particular things. So for example, in semiconductors, probably most people would view semiconductors as being the technological engine of Silicon Valley. And that while technologists think of, when they think of semiconductors, they think of Moore's Law and a uh, number of transistors on a chip doubling uh, every 18 months and increase in processing power. But economists think about the rise of semiconductors as a drop in the cost of a foundational input. And that input, in the case of semiconductors, uh, is arithmetic. And so why that's interesting is not just because when the cost of arithmetic fell, that things that traditionally used arithmetic as an input became cheaper. So in the early days, that was the computation of, of large data sets, things like the Census Bureau and artillery tables. But now, that not only did those things become cheaper, but arithmetic became so cheap that we started using arithmetic to solve problems that historically hadn't been viewed as arithmetic problems. For example, photography. Once arithmetic became cheap, we moved from a chemistry-based solution to photography to an arithmetic-based solution. And so we started using arithmetic to solve all sorts of things that hadn't previously been arithmetic problems. And so it is with machine intelligence. That the economist view of machine intelligence, the rise of this, is actually the fall in the cost of uh, a, a, a foundational input. And in the case of machine intelligence, uh, that input is prediction. A, a perhaps a more accurate term would be inference, but for the purposes of this discussion, I'll just use the term uh, prediction. <clears throat> and so a drop in the cost of prediction will do a few things. The obvious one is it will lower the cost of activities that are traditionally used prediction as an input. So for example, predicting the weather or, pre or demand forecasting, inventory management. But what's more interesting is that we'll start using predictions to solve problems that traditionally weren't prediction problems because it's become so cheap. So for example, uh, in the case of uh, photography, where we began to use arithmetic as a uh, solution for this problem. Similarly, in the case of uh, navigation, we've begun to use prediction. So we've had navigation for uh, over two decades, uh, uh, autonomous vehicles. But those autonomous vehicles were in contr very controlled environments, in factories and warehouses where we had uh, blueprints, floor plans, and engineers could design their robots to maneuver around the, uh, the, the uh, floor space with very basic logical intelligence. If a human walks in front, uh, stop. If this happens, turn right. If this happens, turn left. However, they can never take those types of vehicles and put them on a city street because there's simply, in an uncontrolled environment, there's simply too many variables. There'd be an infinite number of, of if-then, uh, else type statements. They couldn't do that until they reframed the problem as a prediction problem. And the prediction problem became, what would a human do? 
And so they simply outfitted the uh, vehicles with sensors, as everybody here has now seen, uh, radar, radar, and then put a human inside the driver's seat and told them to drive. And for the non-practitioners, the simple way to think of this is just imagine an AI sitting in the car watching all the environmental data come in and then watching the human uh, action response to the incoming data. And the AI is learning basically to predict over time what will the human do when this environmental data comes in. Does the human turn right? Does the human brake? Does the human accelerate? And so on. So they turn navigation into a prediction problem because it becomes so cheap. <clears throat> so the implications of if we think about AI as a, a, the rise in AI as they drop in the cost of prediction, it gives us a few useful insights about the economy. I'm just going to describe two. The first one, the one I've just uh, mentioned, is that we'll start using prediction to solve a myriad of problems for which we hadn't used prediction as a solution tool. <clears throat> a second economic effect is that a drop in the cost of prediction will change the value of other things that aren't prediction. So, for example, uh, so the value of some things will go up, the value of other things will go down, and how we will determine which things will go up and which things will go down is by, by uh, speculating on what will be uh, complements to prediction and what will be substitutes. So, going back to our example of photography, that in the case of photography, when we shifted to an arithmetic solution to photography, the complements uh, to arithmetic, so in that case, think of the digital camera. As we began to produce more and more digital cameras, the complements to arithmetic were the other inputs to digital cameras, so the hardware and software inputs to uh, making a digital camera. The value of that stuff went up because we wanted more and more of it. And the value of the substitutes... So in this case, it was the uh, chemical-based uh, traditional photography, film photography. The, uh, the value of those comp uh, components went down. In the case of AI, most people are thinking machine intelligence in terms of uh, what it's going to do to automation. So the ways in which it's going to integrate into activities that currently are done by humans. We can characterize all activities in uh, having these types of elements. So six ele these, these six elements. So for example, imagine that you have a pain in your leg and therefore you go to the doctor. And the doctor sees you and takes an x-ray and a blood test and asks you questions. That's, that's the data, data collection. Then the doctor makes some predictions. Uh, she says, okay, uh, that I, I predict that if I give you treatment A, that there'll be outcome X. And if I give you treatment B, there'll be outcome Y with some kind of probability dis distribution. And uh, given your age and your risk preferences and so on, uh, I'm going to um, recommend that you do treatment A. And so that's using her judgment. And then there's the actual uh, administering of treatment A. That's the action. And then there is the, uh, your leg is healed with a minor side effect. That's the outcome. And so taking the data and the action and the outcome, that information goes back into updating our prediction model. So this is for, you know, for the non-practitioners just giving you a sense of uh, how we can break up these uh, simple tasks uh, into, this, into this setting. And it, the reason it's useful is it helps us think about what parts of human labor will diminish in value and what will increase. And so what will diminish are the, are the parts of our work that are prediction. Because machine intelligence is a substitute for human prediction. But machine intelligence is a complement to human judgment. So in other words, as the cost of prediction falls, the value of human judgment increases. So for example, we're, uh, everyone that's carrying these devices, as these handheld devices uh, continue to increase in their capabilities, they get covered with more and more sensors, there will surely be a day not too far away that every time we pick up our phone and we put it to our ear, it's taking data from our ears, our temperature, our pulse, and everything else as we are uh, just handling it in our regular use. And it will be making constant predictions about our health. And it will predict, for example, that 20% of us have an early onset of some uh, treatable uh, ailment, way before we normally would be diagnosed. Now, if that were to happen, that would replace human effort in terms of diagnosis, but it would substantively increase the demand for other human labor in dealing with a surge of 20% more people who are now uh, needing care that they didn't realize they needed.
and all the judgment, the ethics, the empathy, the compassion, the human things that we do uh, to, in response to the information that we learn from the So while some people have taken the view that the rise in machine intelligence will lead to the elimination of the need for human work, we don't believe that. Uh, our view at the moment is that it will diminish the value of human skills and activities concerning prediction, but increase the value of that with respect to judgment. So let me conclude with the, with the point that, uh, uh, for, particularly for non-practitioners, you may feel a little overwhelmed today. You're going to see uh, a, a really smorgasbord of ideas and implementations of AI. And as you see this, I think a useful way to organize your thoughts and make sense of the day is every time you see an implementation, you can break it up into your head of what part's prediction and what part's judgment. And many of these, what you're going to see is that the AI is, is performing some kind of prediction, and then it hands the prediction over to a human who then applies their judgment and subsequently takes an action. And as you listen to the entrepreneurs, what you're going to hear is they'll tell you their roadmap, how they think this is going to develop. And what you'll hear in the roadmap is a shifting, pushing out the boundary of between prediction and judgment. That the machine's doing more and more prediction, and it's, it's pushing out the, the requirement of what the human judgment needs to, uh, needs to do. And in fact, in the session just before lunch, you're going to hear a presentation that's going to make the case of machines ultimately trend, uh, um, uh, transcending prediction towards understanding. And that will, of course, have significant and interesting economic implications. Mm -hmm.